Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I mean, um, I'd like to introduce you to Steve from Sydney, and uh, he's going to look after you in this meeting, and uh, I'm sure he'll do a pretty good job. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, and good morning all. My name's Steve, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, and uh, thanks for that. And uh, as you all know, this is a spiritual concept meeting this morning, and I've always understood that to mean a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with a special emphasis on the spirituality, which I and many of us believe is the heart of the program. We'll hear speakers from uh, most states of Australia uh, and from some overseas countries. I would like to apologise to any of my friends I'm unable to get to and to assure everybody that I will do what I always try and do and call without uh, favour or without fear. But, you know, adhere to the list that's been uh, given to me and to conform to the suggestions of the committee. I try and do that in Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, the uh, perhaps some of you may have noticed I didn't speak of the spiritual side of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said I spoke of the spirituality that runs through Alcoholics Anonymous because I think it touches all sides of our life. Uh, for me, my alcoholism is primarily uh, a spiritual malady. It began in me, I believe I was sick in the spirit before I was sick anywhere else. What I was like, uh, as briefly as I can to give you an idea what I was like as a person, I always think the preamble when it says what we were like, what happened and what we are like now, that means not only what we were like as uh, practicing alcoholics, but what we were like as human beings, as people. And what I was like, I think, is best and perhaps points up the uh, m- the malady with which I came onto the planet. The first manifestations of this spiritual malady in me, and it's the story of a little baby who was born in a hospital, had just been born, and he was a difficult delivery. And they had some trouble getting him into the world. The doctors and the nurses were in attendance and they got him in. They, and he arrived and they got him on the table and he was twisting and writhing around. He seemed to be restless, uneasy and dissatisfied, as our big book says. And uh, as Dr. Silkworth said, and uh, one of the doctors uh, said to the nurses, lest he hurt himself, they said, quick, grab him. And with that, the little baby jumped off the table and shot out, crawled over in the corner and hid under a table. And they got him back up and dusted him down and the doctor said to him, what on earth did you run and hide for? He said, I only said, grab him. And the baby replied, he said, oh gee, he said, I thought you said stab him. <laughs> you know, and uh, that sums up fairly adequately, you know, what I was like as a child. I seemed to be born, as that big book says, in the doctor's opinion, restless, without alcohol, restless, uneasy, and dissatisfied. And when I discovered alcohol at the age of 15, you know, I had been like a city without lights, and uh, and, and the switch was thrown, and it did wondrous things for me. And what alcohol did for me, and I'll make this as brief as I possibly can, I was to learn when I'd been in AA four or five years, I was reading uh, some reprints of articles in the grapevine, some reprints of letters that had been uh, exchanged between one of our co-founders, the late Bill W. and Dr. Carl Jung, uh, one of the co-founders of modern psychiatry, and, and and Bill had written to Jung and he told him of the... Uh, inception of AA and uh, 
Uh, and Jung had written back and congratulated Bill and he said it's a wonderful thing and he had wished him well. And then he had said something that had great meaning for me and I explained much of my alcoholism to me. He said, you know, Bill, he said, it is not for mere perversity that alcoholics pursue alcohol. He said, but in alcohol, the alcoholic finds something akin to a basic spiritual experience. And I knew what he meant. For in alcohol, see, it wasn't for perverse or frivolous reasons. It wasn't for gluttony or a depth that wasn't for escape. It was a search for ecstasy. I found in alcohol a basic spiritual experience. And I drank it as long as I could. And I became very, very sick. And I became very sick in the spirit. I was God sick long before I was grog sick. I remember my late sister, who many of you would have had the uh, pleasure and the privilege of knowing, who died three years ago on the 3rd of January. She came to AA before I did, and she took me to a meeting, my first meeting at Newtown. I was about 30 years of age, and uh, and she took me into this meeting, and I I was very God. See, I couldn't uh, bear the word God to be uttered in my company. You know, it was the one thing that would arouse instant uh, violence and uh, antagonism within me. And I went to this meeting and I stayed about ten minutes and somebody mentioned the word God. And I might as well have yelled out fire or police because it had the same effect on me, you know. I I evacuated the premises. (laughs) We're great evacuators, we alcoholics. And... uh, I didn't come back for seven years, you know. But when I did come back, it was in uh, Hydray Hospital. It was seven years later. And what had happened to me in the intervening seven years, the uh, reservations had been hewn from me. I no longer took objections uh, to any words I knew. It was spelled out, John Barleycorn, the greatest of all teachers, made it, you know, infinitely clear to me. He said, you can say it or you can die. You know, uh, get up or die. And I knew that the only hope that I had on the planet uh, lay in Alcoholics Anonymous, lay with this uh, God that I heard of in Alcoholics Anonymous, this power greater than ourselves. And that if I were to live, you know, I would have to get this help and that I would have to get it immediately. I never at any stage felt that I had three days or three weeks to ponder the uh, question. I felt, you know, that for me, perhaps, you know, that it was once and only once that I would, you know, get up and live now or that I might never get another chance. And so I turned to this God that I'd mocked and scorned all of my life. And I believe had it been any other disease in alcoholism, I would have died defiant. But it got me in the heart, you know, in the spirit. And in uh, Maitland Kessel's hospital, 17 and a half years ago, you know, I came to my rock bottom, and it was a spiritual rock bottom. And I thought, the thought that, you know, uh, was the beginning of, of my salvation, and I suppose I can use that word freely this morning, my, my, you know, liberty from alcohol and alcoholism. I thought, uh, you know, of the nature of the, uh, of the malady and the disease, the death that it held in store for me. So I thought, there's nothing sacred, there's nothing on this planet that I can point to and say, this I would not do. I knew in that instant that I would do anything on the planet that alcohol demanded of me. And I know of no greater bondage than that. That's the worst bondage I have ever experienced in my life. And I wanted to live more than I have ever wanted anything in my life. And I uttered that that infamous an irreverent prayer of mine, I said, if there is anything, and I said, I don't believe there is, because I had to be as truthful as I could possibly be. I said, but if there is, I said, I'm finished, I'm gone. I said, if you want to do anything, you know, here I am, you know, it was, there was not, there was no supplication, there was, but it was from the heart, it was all that I had on the, you know, in the world. I was given freedom from alcohol in that instance, that 17 and a half years ago, and uh, not only that, but I discovered a formula that's uh, 
never left my mind, you know, and this work again and again and again. I discovered that if I went to the God of my understanding and asked from my heart that that which I asked for, if I were entirely ready to have God removed, then it would be removed in that instance, and that which I desired was given to me, and I would walk again into a new dimension of freedom, into a new land of thought and living. And I've been doing that for 17 and a half years. I believe, you know, that as spiritual when I say, if I succeed at this, I'll succeed at everything else in life to the exact extent that I'm meant to. There's nothing, you know, in my life that uh, isn't spiritual. And you'll all know every alcoholic and alcoholic spouse or relative or friend will know what I mean. Uh, you know, when I look in the wardrobe and uh, I see the clothes that are hanging there, you know, that's, for me, that's spiritual because I'm reminded of what St. Paul said. And he said, we look beyond the things that are seen to the things that are unseen. And I look beyond the shirts that are hanging in the wardrobe and I see the empty spaces, you know, and, and not even any coat hangers, you know, and the poverty in which I dwell. Blaise Pascal, the great French philosopher, once said, he said, and I was to come to understand this in Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, there's nothing on earth that doesn't bear testimony to the wretchedness and poverty of man without God or the power and liberty of man with God. And I and every alcoholic in this room only has to, to think on our past to, uh, to see, to understand the validity of that. I look at my life, you know, before I am, before God as I understand him, and I look at the poverty and the wretchedness. I look at it since God's came into my life. Through you people, through the wonderful kindness and gentleness of the people of Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, the most gentle sentence in all of that program shall forever remain the first three words of the second step of Alcoholics Anonymous came to believe to be allowed for a person like myself who was atheistic to be allowed to come you know in my own way with my own fear and my own confusion and to be allowed to come slowly and tentatively to sit in amongst you people you know in the sanctity of the, the meeting you know, garbed in the mantle, you know, of charity, to be able to sit here and to be able to slowly but surely begin to come to the point where I could say the serenity prayer and to, uh, you know, continue from that point. I've taken up all the time uh, that I intended to take in open in the meeting. It is a program of caring and cheering. I'm, you know, very, very honoured to be asked to chair this meeting this morning. I'm very, very grateful. For all of the bounty that's in my life today, I live abundantly. I live rich in all areas of my life. I'm especially glad and proud of the light that's in my wife's eyes this morning, the total absence of fear, the great love in our home. I'm enormously proud. I'm a proud man. I'm enormously proud that my only child's in Alcoholics Anonymous, my daughter, and she didn't come in because it was fashionable in, the, in our family. She came in because she was on death's doorstep, you know. And she's been sober over five and a half years. You know. So uh, that's enough for me. I uh, hope everybody's had it's time to relax down and we'll get on with the main part of the meeting, which is the calling of the speakers. And for our opening speaker, could we please have Anne P. from Victoria. Thank you. Uh, I'm Annie, and I'm an alcoholic, and... Uh, hi. Good to see you all, and uh, I'm from... Long Victoria and uh, happy to be here this weekend. Um, I don't know that I've got a great deal to say really. I um, know that when I look back and the way that my life was going and I, I couldn't see any way of being able to look forward into the future of the way that my life was going. I, um, I'd spent eight years in coping situations in drinking. Um, 
I think that I possibly drank on social occasions, but I didn't drink for the social reason. I drank for ease. I drank to be able to cope with the situation, to be able to walk into a room full of people and to feel at ease with them. Um, I drank with an obsession. Uh, you know, when I'd come home, it was a, there was a drink time for me. I'd get home from work and I'd have one or two drinks and it ended up more than one or two drinks. Um, I think that uh, when I drank, I never really intended to get drunk. I think that was the thing about me, that I, I intended just to have one or two drinks for that heart starter, for the ability to be able to cope in my life. And I know that since coming to AA, when I've heard people say that, um, yeah, one drink led to another, I know what, what that means, um, because that was the way it was with me. That was the first drink that led to others. I only ever drank, um, or intended to drink just those one or two drinks. And it was the results of those one or two drinks that was my problem. Um, you know, it got me into situations I didn't want to be in and did things I didn't want to do. And, um, uh, you know, I just basically couldn't cope. And I recognised that perhaps if I stopped this for a little while that I might be able to go back to social drinking if I got it out of the system. And um, So I'd stop for a little while, and they were the worst times for me. They were the hardest times when I wasn't drinking, but I wasn't doing anything else before I came into A. The times that I tried to stop drinking, I'd stop for a certain length of time, but I couldn't ever stay stopped because I couldn't live with me. I couldn't cope with, with the way that I... Um, well, the way that I tried to cope with my life and I just couldn't and uh, that was about the way it was for me. Um, I tried to escape myself in various ways that uh, I'd move from where I was, from where I was living, the friends that I had. <coughs> just prior to coming into AI, I went overseas. I thought that, that would make the new me. I had this terrific search within me for something better. I knew that there was something that was seemed to be missing but I couldn't work out what it was and uh, I figured that if I tried harder I'd be able to find it um, just from my own self-motivation, my own self-searching uh, without asking for help from anybody or anything and, and I thought if I go overseas I'll be okay and it would make a new person. I had these great visions so I projected um, into the future planning this trip that was going to the, um, well, it was, <laughs> I remember saying to a friend just before I went, you know, it's a funny thing for a person to say that it was going, just travelling overseas just for the fun of it. Just, you know, this trip's going to either make or break me. I seemed to have that, um, and yet I didn't look at it. I didn't sort of take heed to that warning, but I seemed to have that little thing within me that made me think of that. And um, when I came back from overseas, it was where I reached my rock bottom. And I came back with the person I was travelling with, and I'm very grateful to that person today. I resented them at the time, but I'm very grateful to them today for bringing me back because I don't know how I could have managed otherwise. But I thought then when I came back that it had broken me. I felt broken. I felt um, full of despair. I was so full of hatred of myself and other people. I couldn't see any way ahead at all. It seemed like a total dead end to me. And... Um, you know, I, I really did feel broken and uh, since being in AA, I've only been in a short time, but since being in AA, I realised that that was so <coughs> true and I thought then that I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it then, but I think that it has been the start of my life being made today. My life today is totally different to the way that it was. My outlooks are totally different. It seems to have been a, a reversal of a lot of my attitudes and my thoughts about things. Um, I'm growing in the program and, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I've got a long way to go, but I'm enjoying the, the growth today. Um, I can see the head of myself and where I had that terrific disillusionment in my life and the despair and the hopelessness and that terrible sort of sinking sort of feeling within me and the knotted up feeling. I, I don't have that today. I can see ahead of me and even though there seems to be a few bumps along the way. I can still see ahead of where I'm at. And, um, you know, I haven't got that terrific hatred within me anymore. Um, I can genuinely love people today. I think I was sharing with somebody yesterday that feeling it's taking a new emotion to me to feel that love. It's a, uh, I thought I knew those sort of feelings before, but it, that's a totally new emotion. To be able to feel 
to somebody else totally for that other person and without me at all in the picture and um, this is a new experience. Um, there's been a lot of things, uh, you know, within me that, uh, with my attitudes and the changes and things like that, it's, I guess it's, I'm glad it's not something that happened straight away. Um, I came into AA and, and it's sort of gradual. I know that I'm still um, growing in that way and in my attitudes towards things because uh, I still don't cope with situations as well as I'd like to today. But I'm learning to and uh, you know, I've got that little bit of hope within me and I've also got a faith today that, that I now I can rely on um, something that I can really reach out to and, and receive comfort from. And that's an incredible experience for me too, that to, to know that there's something in my life that's not just up to me anymore. It's not up to any just to fight harder if it doesn't work out. But I can really, um, you know, I can rely on that power outside myself. And um, I guess that's what, um, you know, it says a spiritual awakening. And I guess, you know, I'm just awakening to, to that spiritual concept of it all. Um, I've, when I came into it, I was a little bit frightened about spiritual experiences. And <laughs> I guess I still am a little bit, you know, um, because of what I thought a spiritual experience was going to be. I thought that it was going to be some great sort of instant change and, and it would be something that I wouldn't be able to cope with. I can't cope with changes too much anyway. And I thought that it would sort of be a total... Um, cut out of my whole personality and my whole being and, and <coughs> all over again or something and I, um, I couldn't cope with that sort of idea and I still can't today but I don't believe that it's that way at all. I think it's a um, growth in what I've learned in AA and, and being able to cope with, with the situations today and gradually learning to grow along those lines and um, hence the word awakening to me. You know, it's, it's really good good for me, but I'm very happy to be here and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a few other speakers that, uh, that for this morning and uh, I'd like to sit back and have a bit of a listen, so I'll just thanks for sharing with me and I'm extremely grateful to have been given the opportunity to speak this morning. It's a privilege for me to do anything in AA and I, um, I often wonder why it is that I've been given so much in AA. And um, I can't express that gratitude, but thanks anyway. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dan. And could we hear from Dan from Toowoomba, please? Dan Hayes. Good morning everyone, Dan's my name, I'm an alcoholic Hi, Dan. and I'm a member of the Harristown group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Toowoomba in Queensland and it's great to be here, I'm not sure that it's great to be where I am but it's great to be, <laughs> it's great to be part of um, Alcoholics Anonymous in action here in Armadale and uh, I deem it a great privilege to have been asked to speak this morning. It's a little different for me. For 20 years I've worked every Easter. Um, <laughs> and uh, this Easter, that's not true. And yet on this Easter day, and I suppose for Christian people, and certainly for me, on this Feast of Resurrection, I guess it speaks a lot about winning and a lot about victory, and particularly about the fact that we never really need to be alone ever again because the Lord has risen. And what better place uh, for us to evidence that and to experience that than in, in this hall here this morning. I believe I'm privileged to be an alcoholic because I know something about death and resurrection in my life that I believe many people have never experienced in the way that the alcoholic does. And for that I'm truly grateful. I uh, came to this fellowship not so long ago, four years, and uh, at that time I'd, uh, I'd drunk for 12 years 
and our chairman this morning summed my early days up to a T when he told that story about the baby. I'd been born with guilt and fear in my life. And uh, that's the way I related to people. I always thought that if people really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. And so I spent my life's task making sure they didn't find out who I really was. And the guilt and the fear built up and up in my life and I needed to find something that would alleviate it. And I went to a seminary at 18 years of age and there I was taught of a God of love and there I was given a whole lot of theology about today's feast, I guess. And yet it did not provide for me any soothing whatever for the guilt that was in my heart. But I guess deep down I knew that Something of the answer lay with a power greater than myself and, and I persevered and uh, I also learned to drink and I found that alcohol was much more effective. <laughs> it wiped away guilt in a way that, that many of the theologies that I'd been taught could not do and uh, in those days in Catholic seminaries, things have changed these days, but in those days alcohol was not allowed in college and I really didn't have the chance to, to drink very heavily, but I was ordained in 1970 and with ordination came all sorts of freedoms. And one of them was to be able to drink at will, and I did. And I found that over a period of time that, that instead of alcohol alleviating the guilt with other people, it started to increase it. And I know what it's like to sort of stand up in front of a number about as many as there are here this morning and talk to them about a God that you don't understand and feel hellishingly guilty because you'd been out on the grog the night before. <laughs> I often hear people talk about alcoholics in AA come in and sort of say they used to go into church and sit down at the back and, and cringe. And uh, you come into church and come up the front and see how you go. <laughs> But the way I related to people, the guilt that I had in my heart with other people was exactly the way I related to my God. And sometimes I hear people talk about the way God is presented today amongst young people is different. Today we talk about a God of love. I don't think it would have mattered what people talked about, a God of fear or a God of love. The way I felt inside of me made me guilty before people and made me guilty before my God. And I knew in my heart, and I'm sure some people here would know, that when I did have to come to meet my maker, then I had a fair idea of what he would do with me. Because the things that I had done in my life, externally and also the thoughts that were in my mind, were certainly not holy and wholesome thoughts. And they brought a guilt in my relationship with God which I could not alleviate with alcohol. And the story went on and I got very sick. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I got as sick as I did. And... Uh, Last night at the dinner, I, I was talking with my initial sponsor and uh, I can remember when I first identified at a meeting of AA and I come home and I said to him, I've been sober about four days, and I said to him, I've told so many lies in my life and maybe tonight I told a lie when I said I was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a look of absolute disgust on his face, amazement that a person in my condition could even <clears> think <throat> it. <clears throat> Because I found when I come into this fellowship that you said, you said something to me in, in action which had been told to me in the seminary 10, 15 years previously. We'd always been taught that God said to his people, I love you so you don't need to sin, not the other way around. God never said don't sin so that I can love you. And you people didn't say to me get sober and get well so that we can care for you. You said to me come along, be with us and we will care for you so you can get well. I'd never understood that about God previously and in my first experience of Alcoholics Anonymous it all came into place. And that I guess was my first spiritual experience, my first contact with this God. The barriers were I guess taken away and I was able to see that maybe I didn't have to earn God's love. I'd experienced what you'd given to me and for the first time there was some sort of a, an understanding that I no longer had to earn God's love. And I wish I would have been able to hold that with me, but I didn't. And I analysed this program and I was terribly arrogant. 
I felt that I didn't have to come to believe that in my profession that was taken for granted. And uh, I, I, I really found it difficult to, to do anything constructively about these steps. Uh, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And uh, I had to be led by a very good sponsor. And I had to go to him constantly and ask him, how do you come to believe? And fortunately he was a man who could tell me. And he asked me to think of the times and occasions in my life sober that I was able to do things that I was not able to do when I was drinking. Little things. He pointed out to me that I couldn't drive a car when I came into the fellowship and that after a couple of months I could. And he said, maybe something's working in your life. I couldn't pick up a cup for six weeks of meetings, going to meetings every night. Could not pick up a cup. And gradually I learned to pick up a cup and he said, maybe something's working in your life. And he pointed out to me that I had to come to believe in a God of my experience, and I had. And uh, God has worked magnificent things in my life. I've tried to, uh, I've tried to do what is suggested in the big book, and I've tried to speak with older members to ask them how they have done it, to learn how I can come to believe fully in my life. And over the period, things did come into place. I found that. You know, I was in Sydney, and I'm not sure whether it's our chairman tonight. I wasn't very, I was fairly vague when I was down in Sydney at this particular time. And uh, someone got up at a meeting and said, if you want to know if you've done the third step, look to your life and see what you've done about four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That made it hard. Uh, and I thought the third step stopped there. But it made a lot of sense to me, and so I set about cleaning house so that I could have more of an experience of this guy that I saw people have in this fellowship. And over the years things have got better and better and better. And I'd like to just tell you about what's happened to me in the last six months because it is significant in my recovery. I could never understand the sixth and the seventh step. I tried, I read and I couldn't understand. I didn't know what humility was. I knew, knew all the definitions but I didn't know what it was in my life and I couldn't relate to it. But for three months last year I contracted a fairly serious illness and uh, I got lower and lower and lower. And at no time did I feel like a drink. I found it difficult to get to meetings because of the physical condition. And so I was missing the fellowship. I found it almost impossible to read and I found it totally impossible to pray. And right in the middle of it, my father, who gained sobriety at 68 years of age after I'd come into the fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous, my father died of cancer. And he'd be known to many of you here and I'm sure that he would have loved to have been here. And that to me was almost a pit of total despair in, in my sobriety. And I found that I, I was totally vulnerable and I just, couldn't, I just couldn't have coped any longer. And the day that he died, I felt a tremendous experience of freedom. I found that because I couldn't pray, I had to ring people up and ask them to pray for me. And it's the first time I'd ever done that. I didn't ask them to discuss my problem, simply to pray for me. And I found that I was able to carry out the ceremonies of his funeral and I felt a magnificent experience of the presence of God in my life. As I stood on the altar, I knew that it was not me that was speaking, that a power had come into my life, a power so powerful that he could use all of my faculties and yet allow me to be conscious that it was God working within me. And I thought the first six months of sobriety was the zenith the epitome of happiness that I could have in my life. But it could not hold a candle to that experience. Many, many times I've heard older people say, older members say, you will know when you have it. And I used to laugh. But I think I know something of, of what they were talking about today. And uh, one of the most difficult amends that I had to make was to my dad. He was an alcoholic and practicing. and I was an alcoholic and there wasn't enough room in, the, in one kennel for both of us and I had to leave. Mm. And I resented him very deeply. And in his death, I guess the ninth step was completed for me. And in the ninth step I learned something about living totally in the presence of God and being humble, knowing that God, I am dependent upon my God for everything that I do. It opened up for me a, a whole new spiritual fellowship in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. A, a dimension that I was not aware of, and yet I am aware of here this morning. Um, I can't explain it. Uh, I cherish it. And, and now I know what some people were talking about when they talked about the spirituality of this fellowship. 
I've learnt, I guess, today that, and I learnt these things in, in this fellowship, that my life is no longer a destination, but rather it's a journey. That, that really it's the search that is the discovery. And I think I understand today that the willingness to do the will of my God, as I understand him, as I've come to know him in this fellowship, is really the essence of my sobriety. And I just want to thank you. I am terribly, terribly grateful. I know that my sobriety is a gift and I know that you people are the people who have given it to me. I guess alcohol takes away the things you love most in your life and in my life that's certainly been true. Uh, time after time I sit at meetings and say, you know, alcohol has taken, I uh, hear members say, alcohol has taken my wife and my family and I can identify with that because you see alcoholism took from me the thing that I love most in my life my Catholic priesthood. At the end of my drinking, I was unable to function as a priest. At the end of my drinking, I was totally apart from my God. And in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, today you've given me back uh, my priesthood. I am in good standing with my bishop. In fact, he invited me back to the diocese. (laughs) The word. (laughs) And I can never express the gratitude that, that I have in my heart for that. But most importantly, you've given me a God of my understanding. And today I really know, and this experience of speaking this morning brings it home to me again, that never again in my life do I ever have to do anything on my own. And for that I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, Now could we hear from Bob S. from USA, please. Uh, My name is... God know me. (laughs) (laughs) My name is Bob and I'm a drunk from Laguna Beach. Hi, Bob. And, it, and it's just wonderful to be here. I, uh, when I was asked to uh, to participate in this this morning, I I felt like kind of a fraud that I that I would be at a spiritual concept meeting and participate. And you know, by the grace of God, now call it anonymous, and one day at a time. I don't feel all that bad about being up here right now. And I feel, for the first time in my life, like a real human being, you know? I, uh, like a member of the human race. I, uh... <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I, uh... My mind is just gone completely blank. Thank you, Tom. I drank, uh, I, I, I got here because I qualified, uh, uh, not only, uh, for every reason known uh, to me at the time. My family, uh, uh, were all drunks. My, my mother and her three sisters and a brother all died, uh, uh, uh drunks. Uh, my mother, uh, died on Skid Row, uh, suicide, uh, um, my my father's side of the family. Uh, my grandfather was a was a Swedish sea captain, and he got his papers taken away and died a drunk. And uh, you know, I never wanted to be a drunk, and that's why I uh, I like to refer to myself as a drunk, not only as an alcoholic, you know, because I alcoholism and being an alcoholic almost has a little sophistication to it sometimes. <laughs> and being a drunk is just being a drunk. And uh, I, um, I always, um, I have such an inferiority complex, and I, uh, I, um, I always wanted to be a big shot. And I went to any lengths to be a big shot. And uh, I used to drink in these crummy bars so that I could uh, make sure I was uh, superior to somebody, you know? <laughs> and uh, it, um, it really got to be a problem in my life because I, um, I, I lived this dual, this dual life. I, uh, 
I, um, in, in those days there was a program um, on television called Father Knows Best. And uh, oh, I used to have a lot of guilt about that because uh, I'd leave the wife and kitties in the morning and uh, uh, check into the office and then I would spend most of my days carousing around town drinking these crummy bars and uh, trying to make out with ladies and, you know, all those good things. And then I'd come home to the wife and kitties, uh, you know, drunk and disorderly and uh, all those things that we do. And uh, I, uh, oh my God, this is... <laughs> mm. I uh, ran into a wonderful lady after I had uh, um, finally just... Uh, left my second wife and my kids and the whole thing because I wanted to settle down to uh, to some serious drinking because I knew that all I had to do was uh, just uh, get rid of all those responsibilities and my life would be a different thing and uh, if all of you would shape up why uh, everything would just be great and uh, I met this wonderful lady that's my that's my wife today and uh we uh, kind of sallied right into alcoholism together. I, uh, I remember uh, a lady told her one day uh, uh, what was wrong with me. I hadn't showed up for some kind of an appointment or something. And uh, she said, Lorraine, don't you know that uh, Bob's an alcoholic? And, uh, you know, I was just absolutely shocked about that when I heard it. Uh, I had all this alcoholism experience in my life. I never could drink successfully. But, you know, I was really shocked that, that I was an alcoholic. And uh, Larray uh, joined Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, she came home one night after her first meeting and, and said, um, Honey, I, I know what's the matter with us. And I was passed out in bed and all bloated and red and sweaty and all that. And she said, uh, We're alcoholics. And... Uh, I said, well, maybe you are, you know, <laughs> but I'm going to go to a psychiatrist <laughs> because I just knew that was all I had to do was to get my head screwed on and everything would just be dandy. And, uh, you know, that didn't work, that trip with the shrink. And I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous to be with her and uh, I couldn't stay sober. Yeah, oh God, I, you know, I'd go two weeks and I'd go six months, I'd go, you know, whatever, and, and any time the slightest little problem came along, the only answer I knew was to, to get drunk and run away, you know. Um, no responsibilities in the bar room, and I could get drunk and uh, spend a lot of money I didn't have and convince all the other drunks in there that I was superior to them and I was a nice guy, and... Uh, I don't know. Finally got a year glued together doing that. And uh, I decided that I um, got well. And, and uh, I was, uh, you know, I really believed, talking about the insanity, I really believed that I didn't, that I didn't run into any more old timers in the program. It was because they all found out how to drink and they were all out there quietly getting drunk and nobody knew about it. Yeah. And uh, so I convinced Larry that uh, as all I wanted was a little sherry before dinner, and off off we went, you know. And uh, when, uh, well, I, I can't get into a drunk, drunk a lot here, but it's the same old story. We, we all, we all, uh, those of us that are slippers know what it's all about. The progression gets worse. And within 30 days, I was doing all the things that I swore to myself that I wouldn't do. And if I did them, I'd come right back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and everything would just be fine. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I blew a lot of money. And uh, again, I I, uh, I I I lost my my whole train of thought. But I uh, I. Uh, uh, One day, uh, about four years after we'd gone back to drinking, uh, I had a, I guess it was almost a spiritual experience. And in my, and in my life before, I had never, uh, uh, I don't know whether I believed in God or not. You know, I uh, uh, I couldn't figure out how God could take care of all of us, you know. 
And uh, my little problems uh, just didn't seem like, you know, I was capable of taking care of all that. Um, and I'm sitting in this bar, and um, shortly before we came back to the program, and, uh, you know, it was just as clear as, as, as crystal that all these stumble bums that were sitting there in this bar that I always felt superior to were getting along a hell of a lot better in their life than I was in mine. And my life was a complete wreck. And uh, I was in debt, and uh, I couldn't tell any more lies to my to my business partner. You know, I couldn't tell any more lies to the Ray. Um, I, I couldn't tell any more lies to myself. It was just I was a drunk. You know, a plain, ordinary, common, garden variety drunk. And I used to wet my pants a lot, standing just standing there, and I'd wet my pants. You know, and. Uh, it was pretty hard to be a sophisticated big shot, you know, <laughs> with, your, with your pants all wet. And I'd been on this, I'd been on this terrible drunk, and uh, I finally got sick enough and dirty enough I had to come home. And Lorraine had gone back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and she uh, worked a little Al-Anon on on me when I uh, when I uh, got home, and she said, uh, you know. I've gone back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't care whether you go back to Alcoholics Anonymous or not. I don't care whether you quit drinking. I don't care what you do. But I'm going back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to take care of my life. And, uh, boy, that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was a real tough thing. Uh, when I was trying to stay sober the first trip in Alcoholics Anonymous, we were going to a shrink. Oh, I was crazy. I couldn't get across the street. Uh, and he had convinced me that I wasn't this big swinger that I thought I was and that I was really a prude. And he told me that I was probably going to have to join the Salvation Army someday. <laughs> and I kept telling him, no way, man, am I going to join the Salvation Army? You know, no way. And I remember when... Uh, I was able to make the decision. Thank God I wasn't too rummy to make the decision to come back to the program. And when I made the decision, I remember saying, Dear God, you know, I'll join the Salvation Army if that's what it takes, if that's what i got to do, not to be a drunk and die a drunk. I'll join the Salvation Army. I'll stand on my head. I'll do anything I have to. But please don't make me drink again. And uh, let me drink again. And by golly, a day at a time, for ten and a half years, I haven't had to drink anymore, you know? And my life, one day at a time, has just gotten better and better and better. And I'm not a spiritual person. I don't know. I hope it's all relative, because I, Dan, um, that's what I call a spiritual person, you know? And when I came back, I knew I was going to have to, have to get a sponsor, and I and I and I went around to all the meetings I could, and I found a guy that uh, looked to me like he was living what he was talking. And uh, oh, this fellow was such a help to me. <clears throat> and I remember he told me one time, he said, "Bob, God's got such a wonderful plan for you if you'll just get out of the way and let it happen." <laughs> and you know. That little clue helped me a great deal through all of this. That you know, all I have to do is be willing. Is all I got to do is get out of the way once in a while. And uh, and and a little bit after a little bit, I I learned that by golly, you know, the higher power thing helped me. And now I feel that it's God. But I see God in all of you. And I've been seeing God in New Zealand and in Australia. My God, it's, it's all there. And you people have been so warm, so friendly, and so outgoing. And come right up to me and took me places. I can see a bunch of you right here and back there. And what a feeling to be able to come to a, find out God's down under too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and come here and get to know all of you. <clears throat> And I can't remember what time I got up here. Yeah, um, I've learned to love here. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a, 
away. I never knew. I always believed the liquor ads, you know, and and all those pretty ladies and those mountain climbers and uh, mm-hmm. and the big boats and uh, and uh, you just had to drink that booze and everything would be all right, you know. And I didn't know what to do, how to live a spiritual life, how to do any of this. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a blueprint how to do it, you know, just sticking one foot a, ahead of the other, and and just being willing, and um, and and being honest within myself. You know, I always used to be honest on the surface to all of you, you know, but I always lied to myself. God, I. I, I couldn't live with myself at the end. And what a wonderful spiritual feeling, you know, to know that I'm okay inside. And uh, that I haven't lied to myself today. And that God, I, I swim in a, in a beautiful little cove in Laguna Beach. And um, God's down there for me. I have a hard time feeling yet that God is within me. You know, he's in with all of you, but I, I still haven't grown enough to where he's in here all the time. But I got a place in Laguna Beach where I go down to run every day and, and run in and out of the water and, and I swim there and uh, I've gotten to know all the rocks down there and uh, they've all got names and uh, I go down and I talk to God every afternoon for about a half hour, 45 minutes. And what a spiritual experience that is to be able to say the serenity prayer down there at sunset and know that all of you are here and uh, all of the people on Laguna Beach and uh, that I'm in a fellowship that, uh, that really gives a damn about me. And uh, to be able to come to Australia and tell you that I love you. And I know in my guts that you love me. And it was shown to me by all of you and what you've done for me while I've been here that you love me. And it's marvelous to um, to be in a fellowship where where people really do walk what they talk. And uh, we're a program of attraction. And you are all a program of attraction to me. And I hope that I can be a program of attraction to the people around me. And God love you all, and God bless you, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. Could we hear now from Colleen from uh, Brisbane, please? Good morning, everybody. I'm Colleen, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Colleen. Hi to you, too. Um, You know, I find it, too, a very humbling experience to be speaking before you this morning because I I still find that I'm at that stage where I don't always feel worthy to do what I'm asked in AA. You know, I don't always feel that I'm ready to do something that maybe I'm not well enough to be here and a lot of you out there do a better job than I can. But I've learned also that it's good for me to try out new things and to attempt to do what I am asked in AA. And I do that this morning because as uh, our friend from America just mentioned, I love you all. And what I do this morning is because I do love you. Um, I heard recently a description of alcoholism that suited me and I think it suits our purpose this morning and it's very brief and that is the words soul sickness because for me of all the aspects of this disease it was the spiritual aspect that was to do the most damage that slow dying within me that spirit of me as a human being that long slow lingering death of me as a person, you know, where you're stripped of the ability to love, your human dignity, your self-respect. When you can see um, what is happening within your family, 
that you're destroying them along with yourself. And you don't want to do it. And you can't stop. Uh, sometimes when I'm speaking at these meetings, I, I use my suicide attempts to describe my spiritual rock bottoms. Because they probably point out better than anything else this long, slow spiritual death that I was talking about. In the early stages, I would want to commit suicide in a very dramatic fashion, wanting attention. But that was to progress to the stage where I really wanted to kill myself. I was frightened of dying, certainly. But by that time, the fear of living became much, much greater than the fear of dying. I couldn't see any way out. And to relieve my family of what I was doing to them, I wanted to kill myself. And I don't think there's any feeling quite like it when you've decided you want to do a bang-up job. You take what you think is the right number of pills mixed with alcohol or anything else you can lay your hand on. This is going to be it. This time I won't come to in a hospital. And quite frankly, I don't know how many times I was carted off in that condition. But to wake up when it's all over and you're still alive, and there's that terrible, flat, empty feeling inside. The feeling of absolute nothingness. And you know that sooner or later you're going to have to go through all that agony again. So for me, that was, the, you know, the series of rock bottoms I'm talking about. And uh, I guess I needed all of that to bring me where I am today. And I'm a little bit like Dan, and I love him too. He's a gorgeous man. Um, that... Um, Oh, I forgot my train of thought there too, you know. I stayed up too late last night. You know, my God, it's hard to be spiritual when they always put the socials on on a Saturday night, you know. <laughs> I should do it on Thursday night when we're fresh. But never mind about that. I'll, I'll carry on regardless, and I know you'll be with me. Um, I'll get the brain into gear in a minute again. Um, yeah, we like to end up caught up there. Hey, that's fantastic for me this morning. I'm grateful to be an alcoholic. I never, ever thought I'd say those words. And I'm grateful for all of those experiences today. Not at the time. Because I needed all of that feeling of feeling so bad about myself inside. In order that I could be completely stripped bare of what my higher power had in mind for me. I didn't know what he had in mind for me. But I know today I've got a sense of direction of where I'm going. And so by the time I walked through these doors, I was completely bankrupt in every department. But the part that hurt most, as I just said, was the spirituality that was completely <coughs> lacking. And uh, I must admit that last year when we had the, the year of the handicapped, I was a little bit saddened that there wasn't any mention of alcoholics. Because from where I sit, I don't think there is any greater handicap than being spiritually crippled because I know that was me. And as I said, you know, I was lucky enough to come back into, in through these doors a second time, and that time I was ready. I was a burnt-out shell of a woman with nothing to give, and I didn't know how to receive. And I guess that's why I say I love you all, because when I came in and I couldn't love myself, as was mentioned before, you love me. And I needed that love. And one of the things I love about AA is the fact that in here I'm loved because I'm an alcoholic and not in spite of it. And that's very precious to me. You know, I'm sure my husband's up the back there and he loves me because I'm my wife, I'm, I'm his wife and my kids are out roaming around and they love me because I'm their mother. But it's only you people who love me because I'm an alcoholic. And that's something I, I treasure very greatly. And uh, I wanted to describe a little bit about myself as to what I was like in the spiritual department. As you've gathered now, it wasn't all that crash hot. But I was like Dan too. I always <coughs> identify with him. I seemed, if I wasn't born with fear and guilt, they arrived soon after. Because I can remember those emotions as far back as I go. And um, I had a concept of a God, and I've always had one. Uh, going right back from my early religious training, and that concept was a God of love. 
And I used to get a bit rebellious and, and have great hassles trying to sort out this God of love with the fire and thunder sermons we used to get in those days. But I did have that concept. But unfortunately, it was only up here. And in the state I was in, it never ever reached my heart. And I'm very grateful to go through all of those experiences because that concept today, through your love and what I've learned in AA, has been able to reach my heart. And you know, and that's great. Um, I came in wanting everything to be complicated. I thought that the idea of a uh, a guide for living this thing that I've been searching for all my life must have some deep meaning and I you know, got screwed up by reading books on religion and philosophy. You name it, I gave it a go. But it was you people who taught me that God really is love. I said you loved me when I couldn't love myself and that was very important. And I could see that love, as I can feel it here this morning. You taught me many, many things. You accepted me so that eventually I could love myself in the way I was meant to be loved. And it wasn't just the members of AA. It's very easy for one alcoholic to love another alcoholic because we can understand completely what that person is all about. And um, I must admit that I am very, very grateful to the women of AA because that was the area where I had most guilt as a mother and a wife. And I really didn't want you girls to know how lousy I'd been. I didn't think <coughs> you'd want me. And like a lot of women who came in, I was very wary of other women. Fortunately for me, I, I landed into the women's group, and for this reason it's still my home group. And when I started to pour out my little heart, it seemed the deeper the humiliation, the deeper those women loved me and accepted me. <coughs> And, uh, you know, they were the ones who gave me back the femininity that I feel today. You know, these days I feel very good about being a woman. You know, I like to indulge in a little bit of flirting with the guys and it's all in good fun. And it's great. And I think there's nothing nice when we girls can play ladies and you guys can be the gentlemen. Because as practicing alcoholics, we were neither. You know, and I love it. It's beautiful. But it was the women who gave me that. You know, I've been helped by many, many people in AA. The guys were able to help me in stopping drink, drinking and how to work the program. But it was the women who helped me to recover so much in the spiritual areas that I've just mentioned. <coughs> and I'm very, very grateful to you for that. And I've been fortunate that I've been to quite a few weekends where the al girls have come along. And to be loved and accepted by them for those ladies who aren't alcoholics. That's a truly beautiful experience. You know, I'm very fortunate that these days I have many, many friends in al -Anon. And I guess I have another special love for them because they can love and, and uh, accept me even though they don't understand me. And um, there's another very special friend I have outside of AA. I guess the best friend I do have outside of AA and they're a very special breed of people and there aren't many of them around and I've got one girls and you're not having him. Uh, and I'm talking about my husband who's here with me this morning and quite frankly I wouldn't be here if he and the family hadn't come with me and that in itself is a spiritual experience to come to my first convention with my family in total. You know, that's the love we have in our house today. And um, I think it does take a special breed of man because the girls seem to stick with their husbands longer but it takes a special breed of man to stick with an alcoholic when he doesn't know she's an alcoholic and he doesn't understand. And to love her and have faith, you know, that's tremendous. And I know I'm getting emotional but that's how I feel. Um, so I'll close shortly. That's one way of keeping me quiet, I suppose. Actually, Dan wanted in yesterday... Uh, down there looking for me and he didn't think I was there. He said, I didn't hear your voice so I didn't think you were there. <laughs> <laughs> to me that's spiritual actually because these days I love to communicate with people because I love them. And um, I, I guess, you know, I'll finish up shortly but uh, the concept I have today of a God of love and, and I see that everywhere, you know, I, I love the water like Bob. And I love nature. 
and that's beautiful, I see God there. But most especially, I love to see the Spirit of God moving through people. Yeah. And that's what's here this morning. I'm very grateful, and I love you all, and God bless Thank you, fella. Could we hear from Steve from Adelaide, please? Uh, good morning, friends. Steve's my name, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Steve. I was composed this morning, and uh, I was asked to speak at the meeting by Steve. And I felt good, and I said I will. And my fiance said I'm nervous. <laughs> And I thought, damn it. But I, I guess I'll get over that. That's good. That means she cares. And that, that's really what spirituality to me is all about. And that's the theme of the meeting. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. But I'll, I'll explain why spirituality is uh, particularly important to me. Besides being an alcoholic, I'm an addict smoker. I'm an overeater. I suffer from an anxiety neurosis and I have a mother deprivation complex. And I have a, I have a number of complaints that I didn't suffer from in my drinking. I used to be a drunk. I was a very fine drunk. I used to suffer from many simulated spiritual experiences. I'd get a tank full of gas, I'd hop into a car and I'd start flying. I used to gibber, you know, in tongues. And I used to suffer from a lot of things called spiritual experiences. And that's what I was really longing for because I liked that way of life. I particularly enjoyed the fast life. I was always into fast people. I was always into fast women. I was into plenty of fast liquor as long as it was free. And uh, I enjoyed everything I did as a practicing alcoholic. I remember, I remember going through great turmoil in my life as a practicing alcoholic. I, I smashed cars, I broke up affairs, I broke up other people's affairs. I was a claim jumper. I'm sure a few of you will know what I mean. And, uh, and I had a hell of a lot of trouble with my parents. But not once did I want to stop drinking. Not once. Not once at all because I didn't understand what it meant to stop drinking because I knew no other way to live. I started drinking to relieve all the fear and all the, all the garbage that goes with being a total mess of a human being, the sort of human being that can't get up and speak, the sort of person that can't be kind, the sort of person that cannot tolerate or be patient with another human being. So I drank so that I could tolerate myself and so that I could be patient with myself. And I didn't understand what spirituality meant. I had absolutely no idea coming into this program, what it meant. I was brought up, I was brought up as a goody two-shoes, you know, I was an older boy and we used to pull the priest's robes apart in the back room because we didn't know what was going on out in the front front row. And, uh, you know, I learned all my prayers and, and I thought this is all this is all pretty good and, and it kept my mum happy at the time, you know, and, and I thought, well, that's fine, that's spirituality, I go to church and later on I found out there's a better way to be spiritual, let's go down the pub and buy a friend a drink. And I practiced that for a long time, and, and, and that, was, that was far, far superior than the sort of life I've been leading, the sort of spirituality I've been practicing. But I came in, and, and uh, on a serious note, um, I found out what spirituality was in a very simple way. Uh, I came in, and for six weeks I was, I was tripping along in this program. You know? I, I came in two years ago, and I thought, this is, this is really wonderful. This is what I've been looking for all my life. And now I'm set. And a friend of mine came over uh, to talk to me one afternoon. And and before he could say two words, I, I, I bombasted him with about 25 minutes of me, the recovery, alcoholism. Isn't it wonderful? I'm sober. Aren't you glad for me? And I thought this was really wonderful. I thought he'd be delighted and I thought he'd pat me on the back and say, gee, it's great. You know, it's terrific. It's what we've all been waiting for. But he, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, do you, do you realize, Steve, you've, you've sat there for 25 minutes and you've bombarded me and you haven't listened to a thing I've said. You haven't allowed me to say anything for a start. And, uh, you know, how about it? And I was shattered. I was absolutely shattered, you know, because I'm a very sensitive person, so I found out. And I thought, you mongrel, you know. It's my floor. It's my house. I'm offering you tea, you know. You listen to me. But uh, fortunately, my sponsor picked me up that night and took me to a meeting and I found out for the first time in my life what spirituality is. Is that spirituality is everything but me. You know, everything but me. 
It's the other guy, you know. It's, it's listening to the other guy. It's, it's trying to practice kindness to the other guy. It's trying to give until it hurts. And believe you me, it, it really does hurt because I'm not a giver. You know, I'm not a giver. I'm not a giver by nature. It's not in my personality to give. You know, I'm a, I'm a user of people and a taker of things, a loser, as I've come to understand it through this program. That's the sort of person I am. I inherently am. I will not change till the day I die. But I'm fortunate nowadays because I know the sort of a, um, uh, cutesy I really am, you know. And, and that's probably been the best blessing that, that the, the ultimate gift of this program, as I understand it, is the, um, is to be aware, you know, to be given the gift of awareness of how you appear, how you express yourself to others. I thought everybody got it when they came to the program. It's sort of like you come here and you register at the convention, you get a sample bag and it's all there. And I found that this is not so, you know, because some of the people I give take, you know, they take like crazy. And that hurts too. But I've started to learn a balance because I've found that, that, uh, along this, along this path of sobriety, I've been crucified in a lot of ways. You know, and, and I use that word deliberately, crucified, because I've tried to live something completely apart from what I used to practice as a practicing alcoholic, and I don't know what I'm living, and I've made just about every wrong turn I could possibly make. I can explain it this way, in that I'm, I am an overeater. I have a, I have a compulsion to eat like crazy, but I, I haven't for a while. You know, for about 15 to 18 months, it's been pretty good. But about 15 months ago, I started playing around with that, and I said, I'm going to change that. And I contracted the disease of anorexia nervosa, which is a pretty flash sort of medical term for starving yourself to death. So, <laughs> I, I, I have found a happy medium along the path by getting out there and trying to make a few mistakes. Because I, I, I came into the fellowship and, and what I saw was the example. The words have never impressed me. My own words are, are but that, but words. It was the example that... After the first meeting, if these guys rolled up for the second meeting, perhaps they were serious. And that's what I found. And they kept on rolling up for the third meeting, and they kept on rolling up for the fourth meeting, and they kept on coming. And, and I figured, therefore, that, you know, in line with the philosophy of the 12th step, I've got to do the same thing. I've got to do the same thing, or else I don't get to keep what's been given to me. And for the first time in my life, I accepted a gift that was given to me, the gift of sobriety. I accepted it with some some measure of grace to the best of my ability, as I understood grace at that stage. And, and since then the good times have relatively, relatively speaking, been rolling on. You know? And it's allowed me to put up with, with great emotional turmoil since I've come into the program. Because I've been, uh, well, as I said previously, I've been sober for, for two years now and just about a month ago, the love of my parents was withdrawn in toto, you know? And that, coupled to my, my, my complex with my mother or my mother deprivation complex would have killed me in the drinking. I would have ceased to function as a human being. I could not have carried on a moment further. But what I've been given through the program and I've been given, I've given the, I've been given the opportunity to see the so-called light at the end of the tunnel. But today things are okay, therefore everything is okay forever, you know. Today everything is okay. You know, that, that's all I've, I've ever wanted since I've come into this program, that, that I should have some form of emotional stability in my life today. And I can only get it as I've come to fully appreciate it through the spiritual angle of what I know to be this program. The act of saying things nicely about people when you prefer not to. The act of doing things for people when you prefer not to do it for them because they're the person you hate the most. That is, is a spiritual act as far as I'm concerned. I cannot pray on it, I cannot meditate on it, I cannot read about it, I must do it, or else I'm not living anything akin to a spiritual life. And the rest is the cream on the cake, the meditation, the prayer, the planning as I call it, the planning for the spiritual acts. You know, I ran, I ran this morning five miles in the, in the fog, and it was lovely. And I, somebody said to me uh, yesterday that I must be very well disciplined. I must be very well disciplined to, to run that five miles. Because yesterday I ran ten miles. But I, I'm, I'm not particularly well disciplined. I'm obedient to what this program suggests to me. That I must do. That I must prepare myself for, for my daily adventure. You know? Because I as an alcoholic, if I, 
if I for one minute forget what I am, if I forget where I come from, then I'm going back to a simulated spiritual experience. And for me, there's, there's, uh, there's no way but back to the booze. Because before that comes in, comes in that dreaded loneliness and comes in that hate and that cut off. And I've, I felt that during the convention with 1800 people here or whatever. I felt lonely, terribly lonely. You know? And so I know today that I must make an effort to force myself to go out and do what I, what I believe is right because it's as simple as I was reading over a Pakistani shoulder on the bus coming home from work one day. He's, this guy, you know, he's, he smells funny, but he's really pleasant. He, he uh, he's reading a spiritual book, and I was reading the big book, and he said, oh, is that a spiritual book you're reading? I said, yes, and is that a spiritual book you're reading? And he said, yes, and we started reading over each other's shoulder, and I saw two lines. You know, my mind zoomed in. I, don't, I don't, really don't muck around. My mind zoomed in on the, the two choice lines on the page. And the, the two choice lines were the human mind thinks the God mind knows. And I desired God and I made a decision then and there that I would know God. And it's been as simple as that. I stopped questioning. I stopped throwing it up in the air. I stopped tossing it about. I stopped asking why. You know, for once I thought, you know, why not? What have I got to lose? You know, what have I got to lose? God's down under. God's, God's above. God's everywhere. And it, it's a word that, like anything else, I started to use and I started to I started to enjoy, and and since then all the all the things haven't happened to me. I, I, I don't, I haven't become a real patsy, and I haven't become a an anything nowadays. You know, it's it's something that I, I I understand, and I appreciate how it works for me. You know, and I must have a conscious understanding of what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about how my God works for me. There's there's nothing in my unconscious about. There's there's no, no pot luck, because my alcoholism is a is a is a horrendous disease when I'm practicing it because the, I can look back on my track record and I won't go into that but uh, I must I must keep in touch with the reality of where my bread's buttered and for me it's, it's essentially the spiritual side of the program and the rest of it's the cream on the cake and and um, so for that I, I really am grateful that I found this that I found this this, this feeling of well-being the, the feeling of serenity, the, the lack of that, not in the guts. I haven't had it for two years, not the real bads, which hasn't forced me back to drink. I haven't had it for the two years since I come in. You know? The humiliation, the, the degradation, the, the embarrassment since I've been sober has all been worth it. The steps through from one to twelve have been all worth it. Those that I've practiced to the best of my ability those that I haven't wanted to practice and I've forced myself to practice. Because when, when the time was right and the light was flashing at the barrier, I knew I had to get up and take off. I knew I did. Because if I waited, this disease would pound on me. Because that's the sort of insidious thing that it is. Because once you are aware, as an alcoholic, of your other defects, there is, there's just no other way. That's why I don't smoke today. You know? That's why I'm not paranoid today. That's why I'm not neurotic today. And I've just been given a message from God. <laughs> so once again, I thank you, and I, I, I thank you for the privilege of speaking at this meeting. And uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much, Dave. There's one very... Uh, we may perhaps get time for another speaker. I'll have to uh, look towards the organisers and see can we uh, get another quick one in. But what we can get in, and I've been asked to uh, convey to you, is a, an important announcement that's been uh, delivered to me and that uh, reads as follows. We have been asked by many members this weekend to provide an opportunity to our AA fellowship to give towards this, con uh, this convention. At a spiritual concept meeting we all know that contributions of money and AA spiritual concept is very uh, intermixable because our hearts are willing to give to help our still suffering friends. And also, it would not be right to desire 
to deprive anybody of the opportunity of giving. That opportunity of giving is about to be shared with you. There are some baskets going around and uh, perhaps then uh, we may get a quick one through, see what the organisers say. But ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention again, please. I think the collection has been uh, concluded and the uh, timekeeper, Clive, who's so kindly uh, recording this tape, informs me we have between five and seven minutes left. Uh, so uh, we have time for one more speaker. And uh, so with great pleasure, I would like to ask Anne from St Stephen's if she'd come and close everything. Good morning everyone, my name is Anne and I'm an alcoholic and a member of... Hi Anne. Hi everybody, and I'm a member of the St Stephen's group which meets a uh, lunchtime meeting in Sydney uh, from approximately 12 noon till 2 o'clock and it's a pleasure to be here and to share amongst my fellow alcoholics. Well, uh, <coughs> like Steve's daughter Kerry, I too am uh, the daughter of a recovered or recovering alcoholic in AA, Rita in Sydney. And I must say one of her sayings that uh, I think is very beautiful and uh, she often says, if you have a long-standing problem, try kneeling. And to me the... <laughs> and for me it's very important to know my place quite often and that is, uh, you know, in a prayerful or um, on my knees, you know. Well, basically, I came, then I came to, then I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And it took me quite a while to come to in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I, when I first came, I noticed that the people who were winning and grinning and getting on and prospering in the spirit and prospering in AA were the ones who were very strong on the spiritual side. And I wanted what you people had and I know that I was prepared to go to any lengths to get it, and that's uh, exactly what I proceeded to do. In the 12th step, when it says, having had a spiritual awakening, and to me, to have an awakening, I had to be asleep, and I was awakened from my spiritual sleep. I was awakened to myself and to, you know, the reality of life. And it didn't happen on the first step, although I did have a slight awakening then, it happened at the 12th, and I had to do from 1 to 12 to having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, these steps. We carried this message to alcoholics and practiced these principles in all, yes, in all our affairs. And when I came to AA, I wanted to have this spiritual awakening and then go through the steps at a very comfortable pace, you know, mm -hmm. and do them in comfort. And that's uh, I seized upon the third step, uh, which incidentally is a prayer in the big book, and like uh, the previous speaker said, that if you do the third step, then immediately you proceed on to four, five, six, and uh, you know, to so on. And I used to get up every morning, I haven't got long, so five minutes or just seven minutes will just set me up beautifully. I used to get up in the early stages, uh, when I was terrified to do step four and the other steps, and I used to just give my life and everything over to God and then not proceed to do another step to ensure that it stayed in the care of God to do my house cleaning and to try and ask God to remove my defects. And so therefore it was a useless decision. Now, when I made the decision to come here to Armadale, I had to pack my ports and take certain steps to get here successfully and drive the car and look at the map. Well, I didn't drive the car, my mother did. But I had to take certain steps to make that a fruitful decision and a proper decision. And I didn't do that when I did the third step, you know. Um, and my sponsor said to me eventually, you know, I said, what's going wrong? You know, I don't feel as though I'm in God's care. And she said, and do you really mean the third step, you know, that God, you offer yourself to God entirely? And I said, yes. Well, she said, you get to and you do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, and then we'll see how you feel. And, uh, you know, after she told me that, I realised that that was right and, uh, and I did it as best I could. But for me, I have always tried to be a good person and to seek God 
And at 19, I, I gave up drinking for a short period of time. Uh, I'm the product, I believe, of two alcoholics. My mother is, re- is a recovered or recovering member in AA. My father should be in AA. My grandfather was an alcoholic. And there were other various members of the family who, you know, were alcoholics. And I was a primary alcoholic, and from the time I started at 16 and a half, I loved the stuff. It filled the gut in my, it filled the hole in my, in my stomach, and it filled, it slowed this spinning mind, and as Steve said, it just lit up my head, swung doors open in my head, and I just walked into a wonderful new life. And, uh, you know, I thought I had really arrived. And, uh, you know, by the time I reached Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, just over six years later, I was completely spiritually bankrupt, and I was prepared to do anything to get well, to get out of the mess. And I had to do the steps, and I had to do what you people suggested. And, uh, you know, slowly and surely, I, ha- I have got well. Sometimes today I, I, I feel like I fall down, you know, my head doesn't spin and my stomach doesn't churn, and I feel today I do not pray enough that I do not ask God for, for help enough, you know, that I don't say often enough, thy will be done, dear God, not mine. Because when I say thy will be done, dear God, I take all my dependence of the people, of money, of situations, and I place it fair in the square hands of God. And then, you know, God is able to look after me. And I find it very, very difficult, even today, to let go and to let God. I love to run the show myself, you know. I love to give God the instructions and, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the shopping lists and, and, and everything. Yeah. And, uh, and I find that it doesn't work. You know, I have to do it the way that Alcoholics Anonymous says to do it because I am an alcoholic and it's the only way for me to stay well and uh, to get well. Uh, this 16th of June I'll be seven years sober and I say that as thanks to, uh, thanks to AA the God of my understanding and this wonderful program because most alcoholics die terrible and shocking deaths. We have one of the worst deaths that anyone could encounter and, uh, you know, through coming to AA and mixing with you fine people, you know, please God, I never drink again and never have to die that terrible death that is there waiting for a practicing alcoholic and, uh, you know, I'm well aware that at least 90% go that way and it's been, you know, one of the worst things in the world. So I'm very grateful to be here and grateful to be sharing amongst my own people, alcoholics, and I love you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.